Welcome to Hot to Trot. This is not your normal horse racing podcast. My name is Ashley Eisenbeel. And I'm Donna Locke. And we're your hosts for Hot to Trot. Welcome back to another episode of Hot to Trot. We have a very special guest with us today, all the way from Parks Racing, the executive director, Jeff Maddy. He was such a fun interview, and you guys are going to love this. Yes, he gives us all the behind the scenes on horse racing at parks, what it takes to be an executive director, and all the events that are going to be coming up in the next couple months. Spring is here, so you know what that means. More live racing at parks, of course. The PTHA would like to invite you to come out to Parks Racing on Kentucky Derby, Preakness, and Belmont Day for live racing. Bring the whole family to enjoy the races, family fun, and of course, watch the thrilling Triple Crown action happen. First post is at 12.40 p.m., so don't miss out. Head on over to Let's Go Racing Parks for more information. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us here on Hot to Trot. We're so excited to have you. You are the executive director of the PTHA, and that's a pretty big job for someone of your age, honestly. There's not that many young bucks in the industry, you know, running a whole horseman's association. Yeah, you know, it's, um. well, first and foremost, thanks for having me. I was uh, looking forward to getting on here, and I apologize. I know I was supposed to be on a few months ago, and my schedule did not allow it, but luckily you had Chris on here. Um, but yeah, no, I, I was able to get this job a uh, little bit over two years ago now. And, you know, I, I couldn't do it without my team. You know, we have our director of operations, Vicki Mangini. We have Danielle Montgomery, who heads up our Turning for Home program. Diane Day, who heads up our tax shop. And, and I have a great board of directors and, and a great president in Bob Hutt. So it's it's a big undertaking, but it's a team. And, and, and our team is ready to, to go to bat every single day. I love that. So you also like grew up at the racetrack and going to parks with your family. Tell us how did you really get into the industry and did you kind of know your whole life that you wanted to be in horse racing? So the answer to that is no. I didn't always know. Um, I didn't grow up walking hots. I didn't grow up on a farm. My dad always owned a few horses with my grandmother at the time. They ran here at Philadelphia Park, back then Philadelphia Park. Um, They ran over at Garden State Park and I, I sort of my dad took me to the races. I'm in a lot of wind photos, you know, from an early age. I didn't really fully grasp the concept of what horse racing really was. And I wasn't living and breathing it every day. But um, my dad took a little break, uh, probably in the mid 90s. Um, and then like the early 2000s is when sort of I was coming of age. And then obviously Smarty Jones. My dad had a few horses here at Philadelphia Park at the time when Smarty was on his triple crown tr- uh, quest. And obviously when he captured the roses. and just being here at Philadelphia Park along the rail, not only seeing my father's horses, but seeing Smarty Jones, that's sort of sort of when I really knew. So I'd say, you know, 13 years old, I knew that there this was something I wanted to pursue. Obviously, I wasn't really thinking about a career at the time, but it was just like, hey, every Saturday morning, there's no place I'd rather be but Philadelphia Park. After training, my dad and I would, you know, go out to a diner or just grab breakfast and talk about, you know, where our horses are going to run. We'd bring the trainer with us and, uh, it was just a really neat experience. So yeah, I'm not really on the hands-on approach side of racing. Uh, fast forward, I, you know, in college, I really started to grasp the business concept. I was lucky enough to be hired as a Joe Bessicker's racing manager right out of college. And when Joe hired me, he's like, hey, do you want to manage a few of my horses? Now, a few could be like six or 10 or maybe even 20. But when I stepped into my job with Joe, um, he had 150 horses in training. So his definition of a few is probably a little different than mine. But it was just being thrown to the wolves. And I, I think that made me more capable of what I do now because I understand all the logistics and all the hurdles that our trainers and owners face, not only here to race horses at parks, but throughout the country. Like when I managed Joe's horses, we went from New York to Philadelphia to Penn National to Gulfstream to California. So I understand all the all the challenges on a day in and day out basis. And I think that really provided a great foundation for what I do here every single day at the PTHA. When you say managing, what all does that mean? Like what all were you in charge of with those horses? So I was in charge of everything from, um, you know, managing the spots for the horses. Obviously we had very capable trainers at the time, but I would look through condition books, pick out spots. I do, um, do the matings breed Joe's mares. He had everywhere, anywhere from the, you know, a half dozen to a dozen mares at one time. Uh, I fully executed his phasic tipped in dispersals every year. 
So every December, Joe would sort of sell everything. And then in the spring, he'd get back in. So Joe's one of those guys. And I think a lot of owners are like this, where it's like, hey, I want to get out. But once you're out, you can't help but get back in. So Joe is like a furniture company. He goes out of business, you know, in December, and then he gets right back in in the spring. So he yeah. loves it. I mean, his passion and my passion, we made a really good team. I um, think we won over, when I managed for him, we won over 1,500 races in, in a span of, you know, five years or so. So we really, we really had a good run. And, you know, I'm very appreciative for, for the foundation that he gave me. Um, and, you know, everything from the condition books to, you know, dealing with the trainers about what horses need some time off and just day in and day out. That way Joe could manage his day-to-day -day business in uh, financial management, financial planning. Um, and I would take care of the racing side of things. That's really interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's different. You know, a lot of people around here, they, they have the story of from as, as early as they can remember, you know, they would be in a barn and, and deal with horses. And my brother and I, uh, my, my brother, Troy Maddie, him and I, uh, didn't necessarily have that very early on approach, but once we got of age and, and sort of seeing the racing side of it, the business side of it, uh, and the people side of it, um, he's lucky enough. He works at Monmouth park. So my dad always said, Oh, you're gonna, you know, you guys love racing. And I don't think he realizes how much both of his sons love it. Cause Troy and I, you know, we talk every single day, we're eight years apart, but racing keeps us, you know, keeps us together. So it's very appreciative. And it, it's a bond that I think a lot of people in our industry take for granted. You know, it's a, it's a family business and it, it just, it keeps everyone together. And I meant to get my brother to talk about anything but horses is like impossible. We could talk about like the Phillies, the Sixers. Unfortunately, he's a Cowboys fan, so we don't really talk about the Eagles, but that's a whole nother story. But yeah, Troy just reverts back to horse racing, like whether we're, you know, out and mm -hmm. about or down the shore or whatever, it's like constant. He's, he's 365, you know, 24 hours a day. And I, uh, I, I appreciate his passion. And, um, you know, we, we have a similar passion and I just I couldn't be more thankful to have that with him. It's cool that you get to do it with your brother and bond that way. My my boys have a big ga age gap. And I think to you guys a lot, like, oh, I hope they have something that they can do in common as they get older. So it's always cool to be able to mentor. Um, what is one of the hardest things about your position um, at the PTHA as the executive director of the horsemen there? I'd say the hardest thing is just being mindful of everyone's position. Um, you know, I represent owners and trainers. Some of those owners have upwards of, you know, 20, 30, 40 horses. Some of those owners have one or two. Same goes for the trainer. I think when you make decisions, um, whether it's racing, race days related or, or purse structure, um, or even days that we train, we recently have gone to six days a week for, uh, for training. Uh, it has an impact and it has a great impact. And, there's things that come across my desk and come across the PTHA that might not seem like a big deal, but they mean everything to our horsemen, especially, you know, the smaller outfits where the impact could be more, uh, the larger outfits, it kind of just goes through the motions and maybe it doesn't hit them directly, but it's just being very mindful, um, being very mindful that we represent that trainer, that owner with one horse, we represent that trainer, that owner with a full barn, um, and just every decision affects their life day in and day out. There's no days off. Uh, they come here, you know, you have to be very mindful about all the time and effort they put into it. And I think mm -hmm. our team is tremendous at doing that. And, and, you know, you might have some people that come in with their head down some days, but I mean, how could you not have your head down some days? You're, you're up at, you know, four o'clock in the morning, you know, usually when the phone rings about a racehorse, it's, it's usually not good news. I mean, you, you guys know that it's, it's usually what can go wrong sometimes does go wrong. So it's, it's just being, it's just keeping a constant mind on that. Look, this is, this is not just a job. This is their lifestyle. And mm -hmm. our PTHA employees, we took on that mindset, you know, yes, we get a paycheck every two weeks. Yes, we do this. Yes, we do that. But at the end of the day, I want my staff, our team uh, to view this as a lifestyle, because in order for us to represent our trainers, um, we need to have that same mindset. And, and like I said, I, if you told me I could replace my team today, there's not one person I would. I, I have the best team, and I've been so fortunate the last two years to work with these individuals um, to make the PTHA and parks a, a better place for racing. Aww. I like that you give your team so much credit. That's good because it is a team effort. It absolutely is. I mean, we represent, I think our mailing list is just under 5,000, Donnell. Um, we just had our PTHA elections a year ago. We mailed out, you know, 2,800 ballots. So, the decisions we make don't just affect the 167 trainers back here. They affect a large amount of people. And, and 
every single decision we have to make day in and day out. It, it can't just be on me. I, obviously, ultimately, the buck falls on me. But um, the, the trust that I have in my team, I, I, I really couldn't do it without them. I mean, they keep they keep me grounded. Yes, sometimes I get crazy, like uh, with some of my ideas, like the apple breeze. We get 15 percent off on Wednesday nights and my team's like, what the heck are you doing? I'm like, you just got to you got to get engagement. And that's the one thing I've been focusing on the last year is really to get our membership to buy in, you know, whether you're a member of a country club or whether you're a member of a social event. Yes, we're competitors on the racetrack, but off the racetrack, let's try to have a little bit of fun because it goes back to that story I told you about my brother. Like we have a lot of commonality. So if you get horse people together, um, you know, there's a lot of good. We just had our horsemen's awards and I know Ashley, you helped us out. I know the, the PHRA helped us out with some of that stuff and we had over 350 people. So the engagement's happening. The participation's happening. We're not going to stop. My next dream idea is to open up an ice cream shop back here, but uh, that's that's very early on in the works. But I'm just just trying to bring, you know, like I said, you're up at four. Jeff wants ice cream. That's all it is. Jeff I, wants I love to have it. a scooper and he I wants to be scooping ice cream. Though. You want to interject some life and some enthusiasm because our best horsemen are losing 80% of the time. So if you can do ice cream, and you can do events and you can do engagement to make your day to day better. I meant what other industry that you go to work every day and you say, hey, eight out of 10 times, you're going to get your, you know, your butt kicked. I mean, it's it's tough and it's tough for those that do well. It's tough for it's tough for everyone. So the PTHA's main goal is to if we can make that trainer's life or that owner's life just a little bit easier, just a little bit friendlier, just to put a smile on their face. That's why we're here. We're here to represent them, help them. And, you know, I love it because when I wasn't working here, I'd come here all my days off. So the fact that I get to come here every single day and, and work, I mean, I, I come in on the weekends just to watch training and hang out with some of my horsemen. It's it's really a, it sounds cliche and I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to put this on a billboard, but it really is my dream job. And I, I, I don't forget that day in and day out. I have to tell a quick story here because I love your enthusiasm, Jeff. I really do. So President's Day, I think it was on Sunday, you yep. were in the grocery store and he calls me because Jeff has like an actual hot dog roller that you have like in 7-Eleven and he wanted to get hot dogs for the horsemen. And I just like kind of get this frantic phone call. Is he like going through the checklist of what the things he's going to need for this, this hot dog? And I'm like, we got to think like put your opening on time. You don't want to be, you want to make sure the hot dogs are hot. They're ready. You're going to have Ooh. enough. You have a small window. You're going to need foil, Jeff. You're going to need foil. You're going to need to get your dogs ready wow. early. So you have some on the go. Where's the relish? That. You couldn't find relish in the whole supermarket. It's like he never was in a supermarket in his whole life. Well, I don't go to the, I mean, I'm, I'm 32 years old and I, you know, I get, unfortunately, I get a lot of, you know, fast food takeout. And luckily <laughs> when you work at parks of the PTHA, you get a discount in the casino so you can get chicken and pizza for a very affordable rate. But I, I don't cook. I don't know how to cook. And the grocery store is tough. It's like a maze. And then you look up at the signs and they don't list everything on those signs. So you just kind of have to guess the category. Oh, it's like, I don't have 30 minutes to walk around. So calling Ashley Eisenbill from the PHRA seemed like a logical on a Sunday. Yes. Yeah, As he's strolling he's, through. You live and breathe this too. So yes, this was a major horseman concern on a Sunday was what kind of condiments we need for our hot dogs on President's Day. But it backfired. It completely backfired because everyone, and I'm not trying to get patted on the back, but everyone thought it was Bob Hutt's initiative because it was President's Day. And I'm like, son of a gun. I really <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And Bob and I, like I said, we, him and I always don't, we don't always see eye to eye. In fact, we, we rarely see eye to eye, but he, you talk about someone that cares about the horsemen. Yes, we have different viewpoints, but I think that is what makes it work. And, and our board, our board members, uh, you know, we have John Service, Kate DeMassey, Butch Reed, Scott Lake, Ed Coletti. On the owner's side, you have myself, Charles Asensio, Jack Armstrong, John Finelli, um, and John Julia. Like I said, those those nine other individuals aside from myself, ultimately they're they're fully grounded. Um, they know what needs to be done. They know their responsibilities on our board, and um, and yeah, we're we're moving forward. And, and there's not a better board I could ask for. That's great. So you own horses now. You actually have a stable with your brother, Three M's Racing, right? M Three Racing, and I always get a lot of slack for that because my mother is heavily involved in our lives. So it's not like, you know, it's, it should have been M4, 
but I like the sound of M3. And yes, my brother, my father, uh, and I are very much into it. My mom loves the whole racing thing because when the guys are at the track, she can be left the heck alone. So that's what she loves. Um, <laughs> you'll catch her on Saturdays at Monmouth Park, though. She does love Monmouth Park. Um, but yeah, that's that's sort of it's the three guys in the family. But yes, our mothers, I I owe everything to her. You know, she really kept my brother and I. I'm both of them. Happy. My mom, you know, she was the one that kept us on the right track in school. Um, and ultimately, the both positions my brother and I are in, uh, huge gratitude to both of our parents, but especially especially our mother. Our, our dad, we got the racing side of things from him, the sports side of things. You know, we, we both of my brother and I played a lot of sports growing up. So both of them, um, very appreciative of my parents. And, and I sometimes you, you kind of forget it for a second. But uh, every chance I get, I, I try to get them both to come out to the track, whether it's on Father's Day now that we run. Uh, on Mother's Day, my mom and I do the the parks racing uh, uh, breast cancer walk site. So again, they're huge, huge influences in my life and uh, forever, forever uh, indebted to them. Jeff, since you grew up around the racetrack, what is your fa favorite memory in racing? It's actually an easy one and it, it's not a winning one. It's actually a, a second place one, but it would be the 2022, my first year as executive director. Um, we had a horse in the turf monster, uh, our race on Pennsylvania Derby Day. Uh, it was a grade three, $300,000 turf sprint. Uh, and I have a horse with Brandon Colt named Boats of Rock. And, and it's something that I'll never forget. Yes, we didn't win. Uh, we ran second. It was, it was my family's first graded stake race. Um, but it's something I'll never forget. Uh, hopefully that gets replaced um, by a memory of maybe winning a graded stake one day. Um, but I, I love that horse. You know, he's, he's, a, he's a fan favorite uh, and we, we love him to death. So that, that's by far my, my best memory to be able to participate in our biggest day uh, and, and run second. It's, um, it's a moment, you know, when my brother and, and I embraced after the race, uh, it's a moment I'll never forget. And it was just a pure joy. And I can't imagine winning it. If I were to win it, I think that would, I don't even know how I would react, but it's, it's something I, I want to build off of. And it's a memory I'll never forget. I love that oh. horse. We actually made him a, a little, a little call out if you watch our uh, Wager Warriors commercial when we are making the bet, the young lady who was placing the bet goes, hmm, Boats of Rockin's doing pretty good. Yeah, Brandon, <laughs> so. and, Brandon Culp and, and Haley Hool, they do a great job caring for that horse year in and year out. And he's been a model of consistency. And that's only because it's a reflection of, uh, of Brandon's training program. He really knows, uh, he really knows what he's doing. I'm, I'm lucky to call him a friend. And I, I think he's one of the, the best trainers at Penn National. So I'd I'd stand behind Brandon, you know, every single day of the week. That's awesome. Aww. So that's your favorite horse, isn't it? Yeah, Boats Rock. And I, I got him when he was young. Uh, I named him. He's his sire's Red Rocks. And I was trying to play on that theme. So Boats are rocking. And the guy at Laurel said, when the boat's rocking, don't come a knocking. So it was, uh, he's a neat horse. And he's, he's, we're, we're lucky to have him in the barn. Oh, so you still have him to this day? Still have him. Uh, yeah, he just started back in training. Uh, he ran second in a in a stake at Aqueduct in November, so we're we're shooting for a couple stakes, and I don't know, maybe I'll get crazy and you know you circle the Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint uh, next November and you work backwards from there. That it's probably a, a a trainer's nightmare when you have an owner that gets a little crazy, but I mean you got to be a little crazy to own horses, so why not shoot for the best? So we're gonna we're gonna keep that. I'm gonna keep that toward the front of my mind. I'm sure Brandon mm -hmm. probably not on his mind at all, but I'll you know. I'll, I'll kind of work it into our schedule. We'll see, but he's got to, he's got to prove a couple of things to us this summer. And I, I think he's, he's up for the task. So if he does that, maybe we'll, uh, we'll take some, some shots at the end of the year. Awesome. Well, we can't wait to see. Yeah, no, I uh, appreciate it. I, I hope you guys uh, get a chance to come out to parks a couple of times this year. Cause like I said, we're really excited for, uh, for what we have on deck from a PPHA parks racing standpoint. And, and we couldn't do it without you guys. How many horses do you guys own and do you own all of them together as a family or do you have any by yourself? Um, I have a few. I think we have uh, eight. Yeah, we have eight Donnell. Um, it's, it's a combination of my father and I. Uh, my brother has one or two. Um, and then some of the trainers that we use. Um, I, I like to own a horse 50-50 with a trainer. I just think it, mm -hmm. it makes the partnership better. It, it gives them an opportunity to have a bigger stake in the, in the horse than, than just the, not just, but the 10% trainer fee. And it, it really kind of, you know, limits the expenses. Should you, 
claim a bad one or, or maybe get a bad one or, or, you know, winter racing, we have a lot of cancellations. So it just sort of at, at my point in my career, you know, in my young thirties, I'm not trying to have a huge training bill every month. So I'm just trying to limit my expenses and have a little bit of fun with it. So I, I, I think partnering with the trainers is really something I like to do. Um, it gives you all the action, all the fun. Um, and then it limits, limits your expansion, uh, ex, uh, expenses to some extent. Has there ever been an opportunity for you to buy a horse that you passed on that you're now like kicking yourself that you should have gone in on that horse? I don't, I'd say the answer to that is maybe no for that, but there is a horse that I ran in a maiden 10 claiming race who has gone on to make about 360,000. And she ran yesterday here at parks. Her name is beach days, Jersey bread. And, um, it's tough to watch, especially like sitting in my office, watching my racetrack and, and seeing a horse that I put out there for Maiden 10, but um, Farrell man trains her and I couldn't be more happy for Farrell and the owners. But um, yeah, I wouldn't say I missed an opportunity to buy one, but I sure as heck, uh, I sure as heck misjudged talent at an early age for her. But I think if you're in this game long enough, you're going to have the ups and you're going to have the downs and you're going to have the gut punches. And, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's not stellar on a, Wednesday afternoon watching her run second in a $55,000 allowance race. But, um, hey, we move on. You know, you, you can't, if you could predict the future, I think we'd all probably have different jobs if probably no jobs with, you know, Powerball numbers and all of that. So, yeah, it's, I haven't missed an opportunity to buy one, but I sure as heck have maybe um, missed an opportunity on keeping some of the ones that I had. That's the name That's of really the game, good. sadly. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, it's what, 97, 96, 97% of our races are, starter or, or claiming races it's the bread and butter mm -hmm. of what our track does so you have to run them where they can win and um sometimes when you run them where they can win and they, and they jump up and win yes that's great you get a purse but if you lose the horse and now that horse has all that confidence going into their next race for for their new connections i mean you can't you can't really put a price on that yeah do you consider yourself an annoying owner like how hands-on are you are you calling Ooh. your trainer every time you're racing no, I'm just calling the trainer saying, how's the horse doing? And then if they say it's doing well, I'll do the rest of the legwork. So I'll, I'll look up the condition book. I'll enter the horses. I'm very hands-on. I don't go to the barn that much because obviously with this job, I don't have the opportunity to leave the office too much. But I like to be very hands-on when it comes to entering horses, looking up spots. But they just need to give me the green light that the horse is doing good and it's sitting on go. And then, and then I'll do the rest. Hmm. Just going to change gears a little bit. I would love to know... What misconception do you think the public has about the horse racing industry that if you could relay that information that it, that's untrue that you would? Two things. Um, first and foremost, uh, you know, horse care and horse safety. Um, I think right now from a national standpoint, racing has a bad rap. And I'm not going to say the names of articles that come out or, or Sunday night television programs that come out. But there is a reason why our men and women have their alarms set for 3.30, 4, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. They come to that barn every single day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Most assistant trainers, most trainers, most grooms, they get a day off maybe once every two, once every three weeks. They're not waking up to that alarm and they're not coming to the track, whether it's you know 95 degrees or 15 degrees, because they're thinking about that paycheck at the end of the week. They're coming to that barn, they're coming to the track, because they love those horses. They spend their entire lives around those horses. There are any other industry they could work probably for similar to equal pay, whatever the case may be, but they chose this industry. They chose racing because they love the horses and our horsemen put our horses first. I mean, our fatality rate has gone down drastically with the new implementations from the Pennsylvania Horse Racing Commission. We have tremendous state vets on staff. We have Turning for Home, our aftercare program. We just surpassed 4,000 horses that we have safely and successfully rehome. So the biggest misconception is horse care. I mean, people think that we run the horses and all we care about is the purse. Like I just said, a, a good operation, they win 20% of the time, 80% of the time they're going home without their photo, but they're going home because they want to work with horses. They love the horses and we couldn't do enough for the horses. So that's first and foremost. And then the second misconception I would say is the sport of Kings. Yes, you have the Dubai World Cup, you have the Saudi Cup, Technically, and I mean, realistically, that's Kings racing horses. You know, that's the sport of Kings. But for our track, which I consider a top tier track, uh, we run two grade ones here. You have the tracks like Saratoga, you know, Monmouth, Delaware, Laurel, all those tracks. You have a lot of horsemen 
that they they run their business, you know, month to month, purse to purse, paycheck to paycheck. It's a blue collar, hardworking industry. And those people that think, oh, I can't relate to horse owners or whatever the case may be, that is not true for the most part. I mean, we have hardworking individuals who are trying to make a living in this tough sport around horses they love. So I'd say, you know, the, the people that say, oh, that's just for the wealthy. And uh, I don't, you know, it's that that is a misconception. Yes. Are there very wealthy owners? Absolutely. You could say that about any industry, about any hobby. But the day to day men and women, um, there's something to be said for that. And, and I think that just goes to show the hard work that they put in, the belief in themselves and the training programs they provide. It's um, it's really remarkable. And the, the people that can see it from afar, um, I really wish I could just bottle it up and show them what I see each and every day. And, you know, I've my office, my door is always open. That's a policy that, you know, I said in my introductory speech. And if my door is ever shut, I, I get a lot of slack for it. So my door is always open. People come in, they tell me their stories. They tell me with what they're dealing with, because aside from dealing with the barn and all the horses and, you know, whether you have a bowed tendon or a horse that's off his feet or temperatures in the barn, people are dealing with their everyday lives, too. So it's trainers deal with with so much and i and i just again our, our message is to to let people know that you know they are humans they're blue collar hard working people and they deserve recognition and that's what we're trying to provide each and every day that's awesome yeah i agree with you it's not the sport of kings <laughs> it's that's a really it's a really hard life and um but it's also a very rewarding rewarding industry to be in and i know we we're not in the barns. I know I'm not every single day. Don Al is. Don Al's in the barn. <laughs> but, you know, I wouldn't have a job if it wasn't for those hardworking people and the horses they have. Well, let's talk a little bit about what's coming up for you guys this summer. You know, it's get the temperatures heating up. So parks and the PTHA really work hard together. Why is that so important for you guys to work together? And then what are you excited about coming up? Well, I think it's important for for multifaceted. You know, the racetrack uh, worries about the racetrack side of things when when it comes to track surface handle events their grade ones and the horsemen we we put on the show so they they set the canvas and we paint the picture so that relationship needs to be good I mean there's a lot of horsemen's groups around the country and tracks and I won't name them but they don't necessarily have a good relationship but you have to have a good working relationship I'm not going to compare it to like an apartment and a tenant but essentially they have the facility we occupy the space, we put on the show, and we are getting, uh, you know, 93% of our purses come from their slot machines. So you're better off having a working relationship to get things done. Because at the end of the day, when parks racing benefits, my horsemen benefit. So if parks, if their handle goes up, we get a larger, you know, we get a percent of the handle. If their, if their racing quality goes up, our horsemen have the ability to raise their stock so, you know, a high tide raises all ships and I just can't imagine not having some rapport with the racetrack because we're in this together. Our Let's Go Racing show that the PTHA produces, um, yes, the PTHA, the horsemen produce it, but there's people that sit at home that think that Parks is producing it. And at the end of the day, I don't care who they think produces it. As long as they say, hey, Parks is doing some stuff because if you get, you know, an extra 20 or 30 people that come out to the track, on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or some of our select Saturdays, we all benefit. So we want the track to do good. The track wants our horsemen to do good. Because mm -hmm. ultimately, yes, PTHA Parks, two distinct separate entities. But Parks Racing, we're a community, we're a family. The better we do, the better they'll do. The better they do, the more opportunities we have. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a juggling act. It's a balancing act where we balance each other out and, and we just have a, a good working relationship. You know, we work with the COO, Joe Wilson. Um, I have a good relationship with him. Our, our entire board has a good relationship with him. And, you know, he's always a phone call away. Should we need anything? He's very fair. When we ask him for, for fair item agendums, you know, he, he, uh, agenda items, he responds accordingly. So we couldn't, uh, yeah, we couldn't ask for, uh, for it any other way. That's the way that I see. And, and like you said about the calendar coming up, we have uh, triple crown Saturdays are, are fast approaching. As of right now, we have Uncle Heavy trained by a uh, board member, Butch Reed. Uh, he's 10th on the Derby points. So if all stays true, I'll, I'll be in Louisville on the first Saturday in May, which would be quite exciting. Yeah, we're all super excited about Uncle Heavy. Yeah, um, so your track, I love your track. It's one of my favorites. Oh, Just because you. I want our listeners to know, it, 
if you were making your way out to the, you know, Philadelphia, Ben Salem area, it's make a pit stop and mm -hmm. check it out, especially on a beautiful day because you have the picnic grove and not a lot of tracks offer that. I know almost all my favorite thoroughbred tracks offer some kind of like outdoor seating ambiance, some shade, some trees. And you guys have all of that in your picnic grove. And it's just a fun day for the family. You have, you have a whole jungle gym outside there for kids to play on. And it just makes for a great family day. And I know you guys have been working really hard on coming up with more events and stuff in the summer and the springtime to bring people out. So just tell us anything you have like on the schedule, because I know I'm going to be marking my calendar. Oh, for sure. Yeah. We're, um, so we're in Ben Salem, as you said, right off Street Road, 25 miles north of Center City, Philadelphia. So geographically, we're, we're perfectly positioned. We have a huge picnic grove. Um, we have a couple Saturdays coming up. We have the Triple Crown Saturdays. Uh, this is going to be our second year in a row running on Father's Day. We're actually going to partner with the Michael Strange Foundation, which uh, you know gives financial help and assistance to veterans. So that's going to be a huge day. Um, we're going to have our PTHA Owners Appreciation Day coming up. That'll be on Belmont Stakes Day. Same day when we have the Basset Hounds that race down the stretch. So there's a lot of fun, engaging things. First time in many years that we're having Smarty Jones Day on Saturday, uh, Saturday, August 24th. Obviously, this is the 20th Pause. anniversary. Pause. Pause. What is August 24th? Smarty Jones Day. What else is August 24th? Oh, your, your, birthday. your birthday. Your birthday. I'm very oh, yeah. upset. I'm very sorry about that. I'm very sorry that we're having August 24th is A- Ashley Eisenbeel's birthday, B, Smarty Thank Jones you. Day. Um, Smarty Jones Day will be broadcasted on NBC Sports Philadelphia. So I will make sure the co-hosts get a shout out to you on your birthday for all the, <laughs> the regional area to hear. And we'll get a Canva ad made. I know you're very good with Canva ads. So you make mm -hmm. a birthday Canva ad and we'll get it up on the screen. Um, make your yeah, own birthday ad. Yeah, exactly. I'll make my own birthday make ad. Own birthday ad. Um, Thanks. And then we have uh, Pennsylvania Derby Day, September 21st. Uh, last year was the first year we did jockey cam. I think that was a huge, uh, huge advantage to our program. It really elevated us to almost like a triple crown type of broadcast. We had a lot of people come out and say, oh, man, that jockey cam is really neat. They're signed on again for this year. So, uh, yeah, we're just we're just trying to add those Saturdays. I know it's it's always a tough battle because you get a lot of people that say, oh, we need to run more weekends. We need to run more weekends. But the way that we're structured um, to run weekends, you know, it, it's it's so saturated nowadays that everyone runs on weekends. So if we can be a big fish in a smaller pond Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it's just so much more beneficial to our horsemen. Um, and then the gambler, you know, when the gambler's either in their office, his or her office, or whether they're, you know, at the a betting parlor or whatever the case may be, when they jump online, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and they say, hey, Parks Racing, uh, we want them to ultimately gamble. And, I, and again, I know it's very tough for me because I'm a huge fan. As, as you know, my energy is, you know, I, hopefully I have this energy for a long time. I, uh, <laughs> I'd love to run more weekends, but it's just the, the business model in 2024, we have set weekends. Um, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is what works for us. Uh, I think we're going to have 10 weekends this year compared to six last year. So we're trending in the right direction. Hopefully next year we'll get up to a half dozen. Uh, we will be running on Breeders' Cup Saturday this year. So that's going to be the first time in a long time that men and women in the area and even our trainers can come out to parks racing, not only race their horses, not only bet on our program, but they'll be able to catch some of the glimpse of the Breeders' Cup races. So um, just just small things, not not trying to reinvent the wheel, just trying to take the wheels that are already there and maybe add them to our car. Jeff, tell us a little bit more about this golf outing that you do every year. Yep, we have our, uh, it's going to be our third annual Turning for Home golf outing. We have 11 a.m. shotgun start. We had 144 players last year, which is basically a full field, had tr tremendous sponsors. We had grade one, grade two, and grade three sponsors. We raised over $55,000 for Turning for Home. Uh, obviously, this year, May 2nd, Thursday, May 2nd, uh, two days before the Kentucky Derby. We do that for a multitude of reasons. One, the excitement level is up with Triple Crown season. People come out. Hopefully, the weather is nice. The last two years have been a little bit subpar weather, but we're hoping for good weather this year. And then two, uh, Dick Girardi, Danny Gibson, and Chris Griffin of Let's Go Racing will give a derby preview uh, to those men and women that want to come out. Whether you golf or you do not golf, we offer a dinner option at 4.30. So it's Ben Salem Country Club, May 2nd, 11 a.m., $125 a player, which is very competitive nowadays with, with golf outings. Um, and we are looking for sponsors. So you're going to see that in the coming days um, to get some sponsorship opportunities 
for men and women that own businesses uh, around the parks area. Nice. So would you say you're good at golf? I'm good at golf for about 12, 13 holes. And then my, um, my attention span starts to, to wander. So I, uh, I, I can be pretty good, like fairly good casually, but, um, 18 is just a lot. That's four and a half hours of like concentration on like one sport. And it's just, it's a little bit much. So did you know, I used to work at a golf course. I was the oh, head. Course. Yeah. I was the head Bev cart girl. You're kidding. No, that's where me and Rob met. So you did that. You worked what at Pimlico in the, you did Pim, you worked for Pimlico. You mm -hmm. did the racing hall of fame there. You were a beverage cart girl. You're tremendous at marketing. Is there anything you don't do, Ashley Eisenberg? I also planned and did weddings. I was a wedding planner when I really? worked at the yeah. I I was in college, so I started off as like restaurant Bev Cart girl bartender. Okay, went into catering, went into the wedding planning. So thing. if I ever get to that point in my life and I'm ready, could I, you know, could we dust off your skills at wedding planning and I get a a PTHA family friendly discount? We'll have to go through your list of red flags first to make sure we can get you a bride. But yeah, I'll, I'll help you with your wedding. Absolutely. We, if we can get a girl to marry you, I'm there. Perfect. That's yeah, that's probably the biggest hurdle. But once we get over that, I feel like we'll have my back. I'll have you unlock on that. But I'm just saying, if you need a Bev cart girl, I could be persuaded. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll tell Danielle Montgomery, our turning for home uh, program coordinator, administrator. And uh, Danielle does a tremendous job year in and year out with Turning for Home. Like I said, we, we couldn't be more thankful for our owners uh, that make that program run uh, the way it does. And, and I know we're very lucky in Pennsylvania, not only have Turning for Home, we have New Start at Penn National. Aftercare is huge, and especially in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I think that's what separates us from other racing jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. That's great. What are you most excited about this season? Pennsylvania Derby Day. I mean, how could you not be most excited about that? We run two grade one million dollar races on Pennsylvania Derby Day. We have a tremendous stakes program throughout the card. We're on NBC Sports Philadelphia throughout the afternoon. We have Lafitte Pinkai who comes in. We have Maggie Wolfendale. We have our own Dick Girardi and Danny Gibson. Uh, Chris Griffin now, you know, recently added to our team. Bruce Casella. I meant it's I didn't fall in love with racing because of the Kentucky Derby. Or I didn't fall in love with racing because of going to Saratoga in the summer. I fell in love with racing because I went to the Pennsylvania Derby. So now that I get to be a part of it year in and year out, um, it's, I mean, I have it marked on my calendar. Yes, I have to work that day, but if, if I wasn't in this job and if, no matter where I would be, I, I'd be at, at parks, uh, you know, Saturday, September 21st. So that's, that's an easy one, Donnell. We uh, look for, forward to that day uh, each and every year. And, and hopefully, you know, two years ago, we, we reached a record handle over $18 million. Last year, you know, we obviously had, some scratches because we had weather uh, in, unfortunately we had some poor weather, um, but we were able to handle it just fine. But I, I hope we surpass that, that 18 million in handle this year. Cause we're, we're all systems go put it that way. It's kind of funny that your highest handle was my first year at PA Derby. That was when I started, you know, people, Most ask me, me. I, people ask me why I was the highest handle and I gave them a couple reasons, but Don Al Mock was not one of them. But now that I backtrack. I think that probably was number one. Yeah, it would be Don I guarantee Al. it. Because um, it was my first one, but I'm probably like eighth or ninth on the mm -hmm. list. But yeah, if you take the top spot, I'll settle for top 10 if, if you want to agree to that. I, I agree. That works for me. Works. Perfect. Man, that's still the derby that I face planted at the finish line. I love line. that day. That's right. A day that will live in infamy. It will. <laughs> well, you guys are coming, I tasted out parks. coming out this year, right? You come out. The Thursday or Friday before, and we make a little uh, make a little trip for the PHRA. We really appreciate, you know, a day like that. It's all hands on deck, and I just want to take this moment to just say, between Ashley, Donnell, um, Jalen, and and you know Pete Peterson, obviously the the PHRA is and in, is integral in, in making this a successful day because it it is on hands on deck. You guys do a tremendous job throughout the year getting the racing message across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and even far beyond that, but. We, we can't thank you enough for your time and efforts, not only on PA Derby Day, but all 12 months of the year. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for sucking up your teacher's oh, pet today. True. I mean, I, I, need to, you know, I need to help you out a little bit because if I have to go to the grocery store to do more hot dogs, I got to know what to get and where to get it. Oh, you're a hot mess some days.
It's all right. We love you, Jeff. Tell our listeners where they can find information about all these events you're talking about and times, everything Parks Racing. So you can go to parksracing.com, which is run by the racetrack. You can go to letsgoracingparks.com, which is run by the Horsemen's Group. Obviously, Let's Go Racing Parks is our television show. Every Saturday morning, NBC Sports Philadelphia, 10 o'clock. Um, and then you can go to patha.org, P-A-T-H-A.org. Uh, patha.org is more of membership driven. So if you're an owner or trainer uh, related to pension, healthcare, race days, you name it, you can find that on Patha. Let's Go Racing Parks will have all the fan engagement. So if you're a fan, you want to know when the gates open. Um, we never charge for parking. Uh, we don't charge an admission, so you don't have to worry about that. Come one, come all, and you can find that on letsgoracingparks.com. Well, thank you. We'll be there. We're excited. Perfect. We're going to change uh, some gears here and talk a little bit about fashion because you have some strong feelings about track fashion and what you're wearing. I mean, he calls me and asks me about blazer colors. Well, I Should I wear this shirt? Well, I just, I feel like that I'm, I don't, I wouldn't say I'm good at fashion. I would just say I have a sense of fashion. I'm the more and more I do this, I, I kind of like the polo look with a sport mm -hmm. coat because it's comfortable yet professional. Uh, today I have a board meeting this afternoon. So I had to go with the, with the white dress shirt, blue blazer. Um, I probably have about 30 blazers and maybe 28 of them are a, a blue color. So I kind of like the blues. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't say I have great fashion. I, you know, jeans is pretty much a mainstay throughout our, uh, throughout our association in terms of our employees. So you go with the jeans, the dress shirts, and then you go with a polo. And I always throw a sport coat on because it, I don't know, just adds a little emphasis, a little flair. I've been pressuring you to get cowboy boots to wear with your jeans. Yeah, like, I feel like it's a look. I'm not, a, I'm not. I'm not. I, I drive a, a Buick sports car. I, I don't drive. a. am not a pickup truck guy, I'm not a cowboy guy. I rode a horse maybe twice in my life, probably no, you know, 10 years ago. So I'm not a cowboy look, but I'll give you the I'll give you the office look if you'd like. Yeah, I think you're our best dressed guest we've had so far. Like you showed up in a nice sports jacket. I like it. You have I, some fashion I, sense. I, well, I, I want to be respectful of the podcast. I meant they told me that this podcast is going to be the most popular podcast of 2024. <laughs> I'm not going to come on with a sweatshirt. I mean, I need to elevate I my did. you guys have. We're cozy <laughs> and comfy, though. That's yeah, guys, we're, It's a comfortable feel. Yeah, I know, but I want to, you know, I'll add some flavor. If you guys want me to log off and, you know, put a <laughs> sweatshirt on, we could do that. But no, I'm uh, very appreciative for it. you having me on. I, I love watching you guys from afar do this podcast. I think it's a great addition to not only racing, but uh, but the PHRA and, and our, uh, you know, equine coalition. I think it's tremendous. Thank you. I just want to know, did you put on bronzer this morning to be no. camera ready? No, I did not put on bronzer. I did not put yeah. on bronzer. So you have to tell anything? Oh, no. Well, no, the first derby, I was like, you know what? I'm, I look so pale and I'm going to be on NBC Sports Philadelphia. I was like, this isn't, this looks terrible. But I gave that a go and that's a horrible idea. Cause like you turn, like you just get darker each passing hour. Like luckily I was on NBC sports <laughs> at like two o'clock cause come five o'clock. I was like a pumpkin. Like you can't, you can't, you can't do that at all. Like Bruce was joking the one time, the first time I was on uh, let's go racing. He's like, Oh, are you going to like prepare? I'm like, prepare. I, I said, I, I know what I'm going to say. He's like, but are you going to like fix yourself up? I'm like, uh, yeah, man, I'll do my hair and all, but I like the whole camera thing. It's a lifestyle. And I'm, a lot of that I'll just turn over to Chris Griffin because that's his area of expertise. I don't necessarily love being in front of the camera, um, but yeah, it's it gets a little little nerve wracking. I mean, Donnell, I know you do some great spots on uh, you know national stuff with with harness and even our PA broadcast day. I know you made an appearance. You, I give you guys a lot of credit because you're cool as a cucumber. I get a little uh, I get a little nervous. You're doing a fabulous job. I just love the fact that he like purchased self tanner. <laughs> and tried well, it you can't, <laughs> like those you had to research those news broadcasters they're all make up up so i'm like you know what if i'm going to make my debut we're going to go out swinging and unfortunately like i said it, it kind of worked out but um we're just going to go with the natural look i think maybe a week or two before pa derby this year maybe i'll just shoot down to fort lauderdale and get like a do the natural way of doing things yeah, you got to read the self tanner because it does darken as you. I don't like self tanner. I you refuse to use it. No, it's like leaving chicken nuggets in the oven. Like you, you <laughs> said, you just keep getting more and more dark. I'm like, crap. I'm sitting in my office thinking, man, this is not going to go well. <laughs> Jeff, we're ready to put you in the hot seat. Uh, 
I'm nervous to answer, but I'll, I'll give it a go. All right. We know you eat a lot of fast food. What is your favorite fast food restaurant? And then you have to give me your order at that restaurant as if I was the person working. I would do Wendy's, a uh, number four, which is the classic chicken, just American cheese, large fry, large strawberry lemonade. And then I would probably get a small chocolate frosty. And when I go to fast food places and I'm ordering, I like to say we a lot because it just makes you feel better with the quantity that you're ordering. Um, but Chick-fil-A is good. Um, but yeah, I'd say Wendy's is like my go-to. I think Chick-fil-A is a little bit more fresh, but for whatever reason, I, I grew up on, on Wendy's. So I, I'd have to say Wendy's, which a quick plug for Wendy's. I'm not paid for this. Uh, it's about two miles <laughs> down the road, street road. It takes about six minutes to get here from the stable gate. Not that I know, but a friend told me. <laughs> I hate your order. That sounds absolutely horrible. And but I do like the we thing because I always take my dog with me when I order food, and I'm like, oh, we're splitting it. Yeah, exactly. And then you yeah. like pause. You're like, I'll take a number. I'll take a number four. And then you pause. You're like, and we'll take a. You know, we'll take another number four, but just the same. <laughs> like, okay, cool. Like he, he or she's like, okay, they probably have a car full. And then you roll up to pay, and it's just you. But it's okay. Everyone judges people nowadays. Yeah, you're like all oh, the kids are at home yeah exactly we'll take nuggets too. can i add nuggets to that i had a stressful day at work <laughs> okay so <laughs> ashley says you're a housewives fan or do you have a favorite franchise Whoa, how okay time out i don't watch housewives <laughs> she asked me if i know anything about the housewives and i said uh... i once talked to Teresa, and the only reason i talked to Teresa. Is because a good friend of mine runs a limo service in North Jersey, and Teresa got in the car as I was on the phone with him, and he then put her on the phone, and I said hello. We did not talk much, but I did get to say hello. Um, but Below Deck, I have watched that a few times. I kind of like that show, but not not a housewife show. Oh, that's cool to say to talk to Teresa. I would I'd be telling people that all the time. Yeah, I mean, I, it's not really it's not top of my list. I'm in a Top of my list, actually, side note, this is what I get judged for a lot. I won a high heel race back when I was 18 years old down the shore. So it was a high heel race. Do you have race. pictures? I do have pictures. I was a I high want them. in Avalon, New Jersey for ovarian cancer. And it was a hundred yard dash in four inch heels. Um, and that's probably my claim to fame. It's, it used to be on the resume early in my career. But when I applied for this job, I sort of removed it. Um, but I always have that as a, in my bag of tricks. We are going to have a high heel race to raise money for turning for home. That's considered done. I it. Considered done. I, I probably it. won't participate just because. No, you will. I get a lot of I get a lot of you know crap from my horsemen now about how I dress and what I eat and all. I don't want to add that to their arsenal about watching their <laughs> executive director run in high heels. But if it's going to raise money for turning for home, I'll do it. We're doing it, and you're running. Deal. I'm impressed. I can't even walk in heels. So the fact that you uh, won a race, I'm extremely impressed. Yeah, you know, I guess talent's talent, Donnell. So you just, you know, <laughs> some of us are blessed. <laughs> I guess so. Damn. What is the first thing you would buy if you won the lottery? Oof. Uh, I'd buy into probably, um, uh, probably one of the Derby contenders. Ooh, yeah, wow. I'd, I'd buy into one of the Derby contenders for sure. I'd love to. It's a race I've all obviously, you know, this is you could ask 10 people this and, you know, 10 out of 10 would tell you I'd love to have a horse in the Kentucky Derby one day. So the first thing I would buy is I'd, I'd buy an interest in one of the one of the strong contenders for the Kentucky Derby. I really thought you'd say you was going to upgrade the Buick. No, nah, it's a Buick Regal GS 19. Put a lot of miles on it. I love it, though. I wouldn't trade that for the world. <laughs> Yeah, but people like in the commercials when they say, is that a Buick? I really get asked that question. They're like, is that a Buick? I'm like, yeah, it's a Buick. So I <laughs> props enough. Another shout out to Buick. Um, great car. Very reliable. Quick. Great on gas. 23 miles a gallon. I'll, I'll, I'll take my Buick over anything else any day of the week. I like that you're passionate about it. You have to be passionate about it. You, you spend so much time in your car. You have to love it, right? That's true. Do you are you a good driver? Do you hit curbs? No, I don't hit curbs. I, I maybe I I'm a, just a touch heavy on the pedal. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. I speed just a touch, but I, it's part of my New Year's resolution. So we'll see how you know I'm 
trying to stay 65, stay alive. Good resolution. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. I like it. Do you think you have any red flags and what do you think your red flag is? Well, I have, yeah, I'd, I'd say, yeah. Ooh. Um, <laughs> I'm, my attention span is short. So mm -hmm. like if I'm working on something, I really need to be mindful to finish that task. Cause I, I do jump around a little bit. Um, I, I get a little distracted. Ashley by, does it. I get a little distracted by the shiny objects. Um, so I'd say, yeah, I gotta, and if I'm checking out, if someone's in a conversation and I, uh, I reach my, my limit, I, um, I sort of go to these like keywords where it's like, I'm still there, <laughs> but I'm not there. So I, I think mm -hmm. I have to constantly be present, uh, with people. Um, that's a red You flag. do that all the time. Yeah. And then the problem is my staff now knows when I go to, I, I say these things without even saying them. And then they're like, okay, he's checked out. We'll talk to you later. So. I think that's a red flag. I think, um, I don't know. I, I, you probably ask other people if I had red flags and they give you a, a list, but I, I, I try to, I'm trying to, trying to step it up. I, I feel like, uh, you know, I feel like COVID made us all, you know, more mature and made us realize that, Hey, look, this, we need to get our, our crap together. But, uh, I, I'm trying to, trying to eliminate those red flags. Don't know. Look at you go. We'll write you a list. Yeah. Give me a list. I'm sure it'll be a few pages, Ash. So just, Get that over, and I'll try to knock some out this year, some out next year. And when I get to 35, maybe I'll be red flagless. Well, Jalen already has a list started, so we're ahead yes, of the I, game. I figured, I figured Jalen. I don't, I don't trend that well with Jalen, so tell Jalen I will continue <laughs> to be better. Fantastic. She'll love to hear it. All right, where is your favorite vacation spot? The Atlantis in Bahamas, without a doubt. Second would be um, the Beach Club in Disney World. He's such a Disney guy. I like Disney. I mean, it's a great facility, great people, great fun. All Do you ride the time. rides or you just like to go hang out oh, in the warm weather? I mean, you'd get on, uh, you know, that new ride. Tron is a pretty cool ride in Epcot. Um, yeah, there's a few of them. I mean, Avatar is a cool ride. I'd say the bigger ones, but I think mostly I like, I just like walking around Epcot. Like SeaWorld, big SeaWorld fan. Um yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm not that hard to please. I'm I'm pretty easy going, and like I said, if it's action packed, it's it's basically for me. Something you never forget when you leave the house. <sighs> my phone. I mean, I I'm I, I never forget my phone. I you know with job and even with this job and with my personal life, I I'm I'm probably on my phone too much, and people tell me that. So uh, it's another thing I'm working on. So I've been on with flag. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to trying to get away from the, the electronics and live in the moment more. But in today's day and age with people emailing and texting and, you know, I, I run, I run the PTHA through my personal cell phone when it comes to communicating with people and even our mass texts that we send out to membership, it's all through my phone. So it's hard, but um, I think it's something we all need to do because you, you do get sucked up in your phone and sometimes you miss what's, what's right there in front of you. Put it down at dinner time, set yeah. it aside. Yes. All right. Ask permission or ask forgiveness. Oh, ask forgiveness. Absolutely. All the time. Yeah. Because my ideas are sometimes a little bit, you know, a little bit out there and some things I want to do are, you know, like this. So you just ask forgiveness. Noted. We have it on record. We ask yeah. forgiveness. Yeah. Always ask forgiveness. Never ask. Okay. forgiveness. Because if you ask permission and they shut you down, then, yeah, then you can't do it. So I'd rather do yeah. it, enjoy it or, you know, execute it and then and then ask forgiveness. Yep. Spring or fall? Spring, because I love summer. So each passing day, you're getting closer to, to summer. So I'm a big spring guy. And that's when our, our stakes action heats up. That's when racing heats up. Triple crown season. Uh, personally, I love summer. Uh, career related, it's, it's triple crown season when racing gets elevated to a new level. So that's a no-brainer. All right, last question. If you had to use one utensil for an entire month for every meal, would it be a spoon, a fork, or a knife? Wouldn't be a knife, a uh, spoon, or a fork. Um, uh, it'd be a fork, because you, a uh, fork, yeah, for sure, because you could use it to pick up and then you could kind of use it as a spoon. Yeah, it'd be a fork, yeah. You put a lot of thought into that. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's a hard it's question. Fun, and I love food. So like, that's a lot of food. Yeah, it definitely be a, a fork. 
Yeah. I'm going to make you like get soup or something and eat it with a fork. Yeah. Oh, well, oof. I didn't Cereal. Think what do most of your guests say? Or that's a, is that a new question? It's what, a new question. I thought of it last night. <laughs> oh, so Brian Sanfratello didn't get asked that question because I'd mm -hmm. love to know Brian's answer on that. But yeah, but with soup, you could just kind of drink the soup out of the, the ramen True. noodle cup. Yeah. Ramen um, noodles, you need a fork anyway. You don't need a spoon for yeah. ramen. We're golden. And I like to undercook it a little bit. I don't like to, I like them a little bit crunchy. Oh, you do cook then. You cook ramens. Yeah, I use the microwave. So yeah, I'm, I'm basically a chef in my, in my part-time job. Yep. Do you eat out every single night? I probably eat out as much as we train here, which is six days a week. So I would say six out of seven days a week, I'm eating out somewhere. At Applebee's? Applebee's is Wednesday. Quick shout out, PTHA, Applebee's, Wednesday nights, 15% off. Come one, come all. <laughs> what's your favorite item on the Applebee's menu? What do you, what's your, what's your go-to? Uh, a couple of things. One, um, their French onions, French onion soup is really well, mm. good. Um, their boneless buffalo wings are really good. Uh, their chicken wonton tacos are another good thing. They have the That's donuts nice. as a dessert. I like the donuts a lot. They have caramel and chocolate to dip in. And then I think their, their steak and Parmesan main on course is, is pretty good. You get that medium rare and, you know, it's, they have a nice, nice menu there. <laughs> they do. I want to see you eat the French onion soup with a fork. The cheese is all you need anyway, so it's fine. Yeah, you're fine. I, I still think, I know you're trying to throw me a curveball, Ash, but the more things <laughs> you spit out, I, I think the, the fork is really the odds on favorite here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Donnell agrees, so at least I got one person. I hate one. spoons. I never use spoons, but I don't eat like soup or anything like that. Like yeah. you can use a fork for everything. You do not need any other utensils. Yeah, I I, I agree. I'm you and I are on the same page there. So actually I'm gonna it. try. I'm gonna do it for a week. Yeah. I'm I'll, gonna test it out. I'll give it a whirl. Well, you survived the hot seat. We're really proud of you, Jeff. Thank you so much for joining us here on Hot to Trot. It's been a lot of fun. We've learned a lot. I'm glad I know now your order for Wendy's. And that's probably one of your biggest red flags. But we still love you. We'll be out at parks this spring and summer. And of course, for PA Derby. And thanks again for joining us. No, I thank you guys. Like I said, I, I know we joke because we, we have a good friendship. I have a good friendship with both of you and Jalen. But um, thank you guys for all you do. You know, I know you guys stuck your neck out doing this podcast. It was, you know, not something the PHRA used to do or even thought about doing. But you guys took the initiative. And uh, on behalf of the PTHA, thank you for, uh, for being our voice, you know, across the state of Pennsylvania. You're welcome. And it's our pleasure. Sounds good, guys. You have a good rest of your day. Thanks for listening, and thank you to the Standard Bread Breeders of Pennsylvania for sponsoring Hot to Trot. We'll see you next time.